global value investing through a different lens. Antipodes searches the world for great companies trading at attractive valuations. Welcome to another episode of Good Value by Antipodes, a global fund manager with offices in Sydney and London. On Good Value, hear discussions about Antipodes' best investment ideas and perspectives on industry and macroeconomic trends. In the investment world today, inflation is one of the most hotly debated topics. As you've probably read in the press, the consensus is expecting inflation to rise, and some argue it's already priced into equity markets. But is near-term inflation transitory, or are there longer-term structural factors coming into play? Could inflation surprise on the upside, and what would this mean for your portfolio? On the other hand, there are many investors who believe we are ultimately in a low-growth, low-inflation world forever. Could this be the case? I'm Alison Savas, and these are some of the questions I'll be discussing with Ramiz Sadakot, Portfolio Manager and Head of the Antipodes Quant, Macro and Currency Team, in this new episode of the Good Value Podcast. Please remember this content is general information only. It is not advice of any kind and doesn't take into account your personal financial situation, objectives or needs. You should seek professional advice before making any financial decisions. Ramiz, great to have you here with me today. It's a pleasure. Now, before we dive into what I think is really interesting and important content for our listeners, let's just sum up why inflation matters. Most know inflation means the cost of goods and services goes up, but why does it matter so much for investors? Well, to answer that, we really need to consider where the market is today and how we got here. What we can observe is that investors are paying more for stocks with bond-like characteristics than they have historically, similar to levels that we last saw during the dot-com bubble. Now, I'm talking about businesses with stable returns, as well as high-growth businesses where investors expect meaningful cash flows well into the future. Now, you might be thinking, Ramiz, aren't you just talking about tech? And and I'm not. You know, we can see this extreme preference for bond-like equities unfolding in, in every sector globally. And the question is, what's created this backdrop? And, and, and we'd argue it's the low yield environment that we've been in for the last decade. Bond yields, for all their complexity, are really just an outcome of inflation and real economic growth. So as inflation rises, so too do bond yields. That's right. And, you know, this could ultimately force the market to reassess how much they're willing to pay for bond-like equities given their own very high multiples. Now that's got very important implications for diversification. Stocks and bonds, they, they usually move in opposite directions, but as inflation rises above a tipping point, usually 4% of history is a guide. Bond and bond-like equities will sell off together, bearing in mind that bond-like equities now account for over half of global market capitalization. Now that doesn't mean we can't diversify using bonds and equities, it just means we need to be more selective with the stocks we choose to own. Rising rates are are typically a tailwind for low multiple or value stocks. So with all that in mind, can you outline the investment team's big picture outlook for inflation? Yeah, I mean, our our inflation modelling um, suggests US headline inflation could hit north of 5% within the next year versus an average of closer to 2% over the last couple of decades and and market expectations of around 2.7% over the next five years. Our modelling around core inflation, which is what the Fed focuses on and excludes food and energy, that might be a bit slower in the uptake, but could could begin to rise in a sustained manner next year as the result of both uh, COVID-related and and more structural factors. So we think that inflation will trend higher over the long term, uh, which is a departure from what we've seen over the last decade. We also think it's going to be more volatile relative to what we've seen in recent history. I mean, clearly there are some pandemic-related pressures that might cause inflation to overshoot in the near term, but but longer term there are, there are some major socio-macroeconomic shifts which could see inflation skewed higher for longer, particularly around China, which has been a, a major disinflationary force over the last 30 years, but also demographics and, and the rise in populism. Let's revisit these longer-term forces. <clears throat> but for now, how does stimulus fit into the near-term picture? We've had an enormous amount of stimulus over the last year, but stimulus isn't new and it hasn't created inflation before. Is this time different? Enormous is an understatement. 40% of all the money that's ever been created has occurred in the last year. and It's a number we've, we've quoted before, but I, I really love this stat. I, I think it it really puts into perspective just how much stimulus money creation we've seen Mm. in response to the pandemic. Mm. 
Now you're right, we've, we've had periods of money printing before. Central banks call it quantitative easing. And the question is, you know, why should this round of money printing be inflationary if, if previous episodes weren't? What's different today is, is central banks are funding aggressive fiscal stimulus. In the past, central banks have been relying on asset markets to, to funnel that money into the real economy, and it didn't really work in a meaningful way. Instead, what we ended up doing was inflating asset markets to the benefit of asset owners. Fiscal stimulus is much more direct. Money finds its way into the hands of consumers and businesses. That is the real economy and therefore has a, a greater chance of being spent on, on goods and services. Now, I'll stop short of saying that the sharp increase in money supply is going to cause inflation, but I do like to think about it as a, as a tinderbox for inflation. Now, we've spoken at length about the strong position of the US household, but I think it is worth repeating. Thanks to stimulus and underspending in 2020, personal savings rates in the US are nearly 30% of disposable income. You know, this is almost five times the long-term average. That's a lot of firepower that can be deployed as the US economy fully reopens. Absolutely. I mean, by our estimates, the US consumers have accumulated around $3 $3 trillion in excess savings since the beginning of the pandemic. About 60% of that's just come from stimulus alone, and, and, and 40% of that is, is simply money not spent mostly on services. Now, we think most of those savings have been forced, uh, as, as opposed to precautionary, which, which makes sense given the, the US has been locked down for a better part of the year. As the economy reopens, those savings are going to be deployed and and that spending is going to be inflationary. Now, of course, we have to ask ourselves how much of those savings are likely to be spent. Now, if we've been in lockdown for a year and and, you've missed three haircuts, you really only need one haircut to catch up. That's a really cute example, but I think you get my point. If we assume only a third of those savings get spent, that equates to 5% of GDP, and that's still a very powerful number. The, the point I'm trying to make is consumption can overshoot in the near term, and which means inflation can also overshoot. So even though consensus is expecting inflation in the near term, we could get an inflation surprise in the coming months, and the market may not be prepared for this. Exactly. So how much of this potentially higher near-term inflation do you think could be more persistent versus transitory? So it's difficult to know for sure, but what we can do is we can uh, break core inflation down into its two components, which is goods and uh, services. In the US, over the last 10 years, goods inflation has been flat. Since the pandemic began, the goods sector has been inflating and it's now running well above trend at 4.4%. Service inflation, on the other hand, has only just normalised and it's sitting at 2.5%. I think we can probably all rationalise that. You know, in a world of lockdown, services such as travel, eating out, getting haircuts, etc., they, they, they've been a big source of underspending by consumers and, and is just starting to play catch up. What we haven't been prevented from doing is consuming more goods, especially items that we can buy online, mm-hmm. precisely at the time that global supply chains have been disrupted. So what, what could the longer term picture look like? And, and we can keep the analysis really simple. Say services inflation remains where it is today, that is the 10 year average, and and we assume goods inflation falls away but remains above trend at 1.7%. A level we think could be sticky going forward. So if you pull that arithmetic together, US core inflation could settle at 2.2% or 0.3% above its 10 year average. Now, that, that doesn't sound like much, but it is meaningful because in recent history, inflation has persistently failed to reach policymakers' targets. What's the source of the above trend inflation in the goods sector? When we look at producer prices, um, which is what manufacturers are, are paying for things, we, c- we can see b- pricing pressures building at, at every um, part of the channel, you know, everything from raw materials, energy to transportation costs. Now, some of that's going to be a result of supply chain disruptions, but the supply chains, they're, they're globally distributed, so until COVID comes under control everywhere, it's likely that tension on supply chains is going to persist. Part of that is also a result of capacity reductions in the Chinese industrial sector. And we think that's going to be a bit more structural in nature, meaning high raw material costs could become the norm. Let's delve further into where we see inflation trends becoming more permanent. 
The drum beats around the reshoring of supply chains, which is just simply companies moving part of their supply chain home, are getting louder. COVID brought to the fore risks relying on a very lean, just-in-time inventory system that's dependent on manufacturing capacity in other parts of the world. And it's further exacerbated by geopolitics. How does China fit into this picture? You know, historically, China's been a source of deflation in manufactured goods. But that may not necessarily be the case in the future. Well, over the last 30 years, China's industrial sector has developed into the largest scale, lowest cost production center the world has ever seen, which has made China a, a major global deflationary force. But that's all changing now with the central government prioritizing decarbonization and, and trying to wean weak and inefficient state-owned enterprises off state aid. Now, we're, we're seeing inefficient capacity getting shut down in, in addition to capacity restrictions in industries with, a, with high carbon intensity like steel, aluminium and chemicals. And, and that's going to mean structurally higher raw material costs going forward. China already has a national strategy to, to lift the quality of its economic composition by, by shifting away from an investment-driven economy to a consumption and, and services-driven economy. That, that's a transition that's been going on for the past decade. A focus on carbon emissions, it, it's only going to accelerate this. Can we spend some time exploring China's ongoing transition to a consumption and services-driven economy? Take us through how this fits into the longer-term inflation puzzle. Absolutely. One of the most transformative events of the last 30 years has been China's integration into the world economy. What we witnessed was an effective one-time doubling of the global supply of labour. And if we look at the manufacturing sector and, and, and adjust for productivity, Chinese labour was 60% cheaper than that of the US back in 1990. By 2018, it had fallen to 20% cheaper. Now, investors need to focus on the transition in China's demographics that are going to occur over the next decade. Today, roughly 50% of households an average, have an average household income of around $7,200. Now, by 2030, we think that's going to shrink to less than 20% of total households. Mm. Incomes are rising. So what we're saying here is, is the pool of low-cost labour that the rest of the world has tapped into it is significantly shrinking. At some point, mm -hmm. the labour discount it's going to fail to offset the risks of globalization. And we could be approaching this point over the next decade, meaning another big deflationary tailwind is going to be behind us. But do you think this shrinking pool of low-cost labor from China can be replaced by low-cost labor from other countries? Something I've, um, I've thought about a lot, and uh, I just don't think it's as simple as that. Uh, China had a, a, a unified national strategy when it came to industrializing their economy. What's more, they, they had the administrative capital to implement that strategy, and that's, that's allowed them to achieve a scale that has so far been unmatched. Now, now, let's contrast that to the two really big pools of labour outside of China, Zindia and Africa. Africa is a collection of 50 countries, so, so implementing a unified strategy is going to be difficult, to say the least. India has a far less cohesive political backdrop compared to China. I mean... The various states, in many regards, they, they operate independently, the, the cost of capital is high, decision making is slow. India just doesn't have China's administrative capital. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting debate, isn't it? And, and I'm sure on the margin that some manufacturing is going to bleed into these other low cost regions, but I think it will be near impossible to replicate the China model. Okay, so we have incomes rising in China, and that's interesting because we're also seeing pressure on wages to rise in the developed world too. We had McDonald's recently announce it would lift the hourly wage by 10%. Likewise, similar announcements from Walmart, Costco, Bank of America, you know, they've all announced higher wages as well. Even Amazon's made a commitment to lift wages for more than 500,000 employees. Yeah. That's right. So why are McDonald's and co increasing wages? They're having difficulty in attracting workers. Now, thanks to generous transfer payments from both the Trump and Biden uh, administrations, the lowest decile of American workers by income, they're earning 20% more not working than they would if they had jobs. Mm -hmm. We've seen commentary from US companies, big and small, across a, a wide variety of industries, indicating that an inability to hire workers is emerging as a key constraint to production. Uh, these unemployment benefits, they'll last until September. They, they might be extended. We, we don't know. But 
it does pose an interesting dilemma for policymakers and corporates. When a large cohort of your low wage earners get accustomed to a high wage, how willing will they be to accept a lower wage when they return to work? We've spoken about a rise in populism and a rise in wealth inequality for, for some time now. Has COVID fast forwarded a need to act? Well, wealth inequality is deflationary. Now, if we look at some of the numbers, the bottom 60% of households in the US save less than 5% of their income and consume 60% of their incremental income. On the other hand, the top 10 save over 30% of their income and consume just 8% of their incremental income. Now, the effects of this consolidation of, of economic power, it, it's had the effect of reducing the spending power of the average consumer. And that's a large part of what's fueling populism. But taking the US as an example, though I, I believe this is, is true globally, both sides of politics have a self-interest in addressing high wealth disparity. Apart from social unrest, these citizens form the bulk of the voter base. And by 2030, millennials who have largely missed out on the wealth accumulation achieved by the boomer generation, they're going to form the majority of the US voter base. So these recent announcements to, to lift va wages by some of the, the largest employers in America, uh, that's a change. And, and we think that's one worth paying attention to. Now, many talk about technology as being a major deflationary pulse because it lifts productivity and keeps a lid on wage growth. AI, for example, is touted as the next evolution in technology and has the potential to reduce the number of workers needed in, in white collar professions. So won't that worsen wealth disparity? It will. Uh, changes in, in technological innovation, they aren't new. They've been with us since the Middle Ages. Um, well, what's different today is, is, is policy. Uh, policymakers, they're, they're incentivized to manage, uh, you know, this rising wealth inequality. Now the question is, is can policy, you know, such as a, a permanent social wage offset the deflationary effects of technology? It, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this is going to be uh, addressed um, in the long term. Now, given the increasing politicisation of wealth inequality, I, I, I just don't think it's going to be a slam dunk that job-killing technology mm. will be a pervasive deflationary impulse. In any event, how far away is artificial intelligence from automating away white-collar jobs? And of course, around the margin, new technology will, will always be deflationary, but, but this isn't new and it has the potential to be offset by some of the more structural forces that we've been talking about. There's an argument that we are in a low growth, low inflation world forever because of ageing populations. And we always get the comparisons to Japan where decades of government spending simply hasn't generated domestic inflation. So Ramiz, let's start with ageing population. What do you think this means for inflation? Well, there's no doubt about it. The, the global population is, is ageing. Now, we've hit an inflection point where consumers now are beginning to outnumber workers. And, and this could be a turning point in a, another major deflationary theme of the last 30 years. It, it's commonly believed that ageing populations are deflationary. As we age, we consume less. But that's simply not true. When you, when you look at the data, what we see is that when we age, we, we consume more. And consumers are an inflationary force. So... Sure, the, the nature of consumption is going to change as we age. We might spend less on travel and clothing and cars, but we do tend to spend more on things like services, um, you know, such as healthcare. So in aggregate, we spend more, and that's, that's what matters. Now, does that mean debt levels will go up? And how do you think policymakers will deal with that? Well, firstly, government debt levels probably will increase as populations age. Um, the... Congressional Budget Office in the US predicts that the federal debt held by the public is going to exceed 200% of GDP by 2050, primarily because of age-related spending. Now, the question for policymakers is, is how do we get out of this? Obviously, we can try to grow out of it, but growth, it's a function of the labor force and, and productivity growth. Um, but as we've discussed, that, that labor force is unlikely to grow that much. And, and while we might get productivity growth, it, it's likely to be modest. So another thing that we can do is we can increase taxes. Now, that's the right solution, but, but any increase in taxes, it's unlikely to offset the mountain of debt that's coming up due to ageing, which leaves inflation, which more and more seems like the only option. But the experience in Japan is, is no secret. Demographics turned at the beginning of the century. So why didn't that generate inflation? Well, investors 
they often look at Japan as an autarky. That is, it's economically independent. And, and this simply isn't the case. Japan's demographics turned at about the same time China was disinflating the world. Japanese corporates are, are, are an extremely dynamic group of companies. They, they could see what was happening on their borders. They could see this huge pool of cheap manufacturing labor. And what did they do? They invested and employed abroad. They, they manufactured goods and services abroad. They, and they kept those profits abroad. At its peak in 2014, uh, some 30% of, of corporate activity was sitting outside of Japan versus 10% back in the 1990s. People also often look at Japan as a, as a country that's tried every trick in the book to inflate their economy. Now, whilst it's true, they, they experimented with QE well before the rest of the world, and, and I, I like to liken it to somebody trying to drive with a, a foot on the accelerator and the brake at the same time. Every time there was a, a whiff of inflation, they tapped the brakes. And as a result, money supply, you know, money supply growth it rarely exceeded 5% in the last 35 years. That's different to what policymakers are doing today in the rest of the world, particularly the US and the Eurozone, where it's pedal to metal. So we've covered quite a lot of ground, how inflation could overshoot in the near term, and how there could be some structural forces pressuring inflation over the longer term, which investors aren't paying enough attention to. Well, Alison, let me, let me just uh, turn the tables a little. I, I, I've taken our listen, listeners through the, the macro backdrop. Perhaps you can take us through how investors should position for this outlook. Absolutely. So what we're doing is focusing on resilient businesses that are market leaders. Companies which can pass on higher costs to customers. So in our portfolio, we own businesses like Lowe's, the number two US home improvement chain, and Yum China, the largest quick service restaurant franchise in China. Now the dominance of their brands places these companies in a stronger position to pass on higher costs. You know, and that could be either via lifting prices or putting pressure on their more fragmented supply base. And also our auto exposures like Volkswagen and Toyota, which have been able to lift prices and improve profitability as semiconductor shortages have impacted supply industry-wide. You know, weaker businesses won't be in the same position to pass on higher costs. And the portfolio also has exposure to companies that will be the source of inflation, like our holding in global aluminium producer, Norse Kedro. This will be a direct beneficiary of rationalisation of aluminium capacity in China. It may even be able to charge a premium for its green aluminium, given it's made from hydropower versus traditional coal-based aluminium. And, you know, it's worth revisiting a point that you made at the beginning of our conversation, Ramiz, and that was one uh, that we're saying that bond yields will respond to inflation. Investors need to be careful what they pay for growth. Growth traps will be revealed in a higher inflation and higher yield environment. It's why searching for pragmatic value opportunities is so important. So Ramiz, thank you for joining me today and taking us through your views on this hotly debated topic. Thanks, Alison. It was a pleasure. If you'd like to be notified as soon as our next episode goes live, remember to subscribe to the Good Value podcast. And for more insights from the team, please head to antipodespartners.com and follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter.